Come and cut my heart out. Come out, punk! I'm serious, please. I know. The man's a master. Clinical psychopath. Hey, what's going on, big papa? Yeah, good. Just everything good. I'm just on the road again. You can't pimp it, huh? Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like that. Yeah? Same as before. Today on Thomas Berryman TV, we're joined by legendary actor Robert Lozado. He's he's been in heaps of films going back from the, the late 80s up until now. He, he's been in movies with Clint Eastwood, The Mule. He's been in Death Race. He's been in Out for Justice. He's been in lots of TV shows, NCIS, Nip Tuck, and the list goes on. Appreciate you joining us, Robert. Oh, it's my pleasure, Tom. Do, do you mind? I guess we'll start from the start. Where, whereabouts you grew up and what first led you into getting into acting? I grew up in New York City in the borough of Brooklyn in the, um, in the 60s and up into the 70s. And then I left in 1981 to go into the military. So I spent a portion, first 18 years of my life in New York. And how old were you when you first joined the military? I was 18. Wow. And that, that was the um, U.S. Navy, is that correct? That's correct. Nice. And how, how long were you there for? My total tour was four years. I did two years in the Aleutian Islands. I was uh, what they called, um, I guess you could, I was a cop, I was a police officer. I was a canine unit. Uh, I work with the dogs. I did the perimeter watches, wow. uh, search and seizure, things like that. My dog was a, a attack dog, and he was also a, a sniffing dog. He would sniff for drugs, so I'd take him through the barracks, and you know we'd uh, arrest people. Yeah, man, that's, that's try incredible. Through. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate your service, man. That's Thank that's, that's awesome. And, and then the, the second two years, I was stationed on a ship. Yeah, out of San Diego, uh, and I went overseas and did a, what they call Westpac, uh, and uh, went over. All over the place, Australia, Africa, Indonesia, Fiji Islands. Um, I was even in Brisbane and Sydney, oh, Sydney Darwin, you know, to Australia, yeah. you know, across the Indian Ocean. So, yeah, I traveled. By the time I was 20 years old, 21 years old, I had been to the Persian Gulf. So, I've been around halfway around the world. Wow. So, that was, I guess, the adventurous aspect of my, <laughs> of my tour, <laughs> my journey. Yeah, in the military. Although being on the island, the uh, first two years in the Aleutian Islands uh, was also the glamorous part too, because of my job, my position, gave me a certain kind of unique authority given what was going on during that time in the world. You know, during the Cold War. Pretty incredible. Like those dogs are super smart. Did Did you have to train on yourself, or you sort of they get you get assigned to to one? How does that all work? <laughs> I, I think the dog, the dog trained me. <laughs> yeah. I got lucky. I, I'm not going to lie. I got lucky. My yeah. dog was uh, extraordinary. Yeah. His name was King. And um, yeah. when we graduated from uh, dog school in Lackland, in Lackland, Lackland Air Force Base is where they had those schools. Um, the class was divided into the half army and half air force. And I was the only, uh, Navy, uh, I was representing the Navy. It was the only dog team in, in the, in the class that was representing the Navy. And I thought it was quite a feather in my cap and King make me, he made me look good because we won best, best dog team. Wow. Which pissed off the army and the air force, but <laughs> he, it was him. He he won the award, not me. He just, like I said, he made me look good. He ran mm. through that op. He worked that obstacle course like a like a pro. He just would listen to commands from about as far as you could possibly see him, and just do things that were uh, almost not, you know, beyond the capabilities of an an animal. It seems almost like his supernatural powers. He had superpowers. This dog. Incredible animal. I mean, I'm sure it was the team, both years as well. Mm -hmm. And then, so, so you you do your time in the U.S. Navy. Straight after that, is that when you get into acting? Or when when did you first 
decided that you wanted to try acting? Before I joined the military, I was attending the High School for Performing Arts. Yeah. And that's when I uh, was introduced to the curriculum and started training. And I met my um, my mentor, Anthony Abeson, who became instrumental in showing me some things about myself, about the craft, and what was required, and also helping me discover a sense of self as an artist so that my journey would not be as convoluted it had as it was at that point, because I think a lot of young men struggle with identity at that stage of their life. I know I was at that. I didn't, you know, I was just being spun like a top because of circumstances in my environment, in my life that made it impossible to focus. So it's definitely a positive impact in your life to, to get into. Yeah, he, he was, he was, uh, he was very instrumental. Anthony he was, and the, and, first time I stepped on stage, it was something um, exhilarating about it that seemed to transform my perception of reality. I yeah. could disappear into an alternate world, universe. Type thing. And do you remember your first, your first acting, acting role, whether it be play or movie? Sure. Um, I auditioned for a film called Moving starring Richard Pryor, Dana Carvey, Randy Quaid, uh, Rodney Dangerfield, and an assortment of uh, other uh, iconic actors and comedians. Um, it was 1986, I believe, either 86 or 87. I'd been out of the Navy about a year and a half, and I had been auditioning in New York City. And uh, I auditioned for this one particular film, and they called me back several times. And I met the vice president of casting at the time, Marion Doherty. And uh, she was very taken with me, with yeah. my, uh, with what she witnessed at the audition. And she, she was very kind. And so then the director, Alan Metter, who directed a film called Back to School, which is, which is a big hit like decades ago, and uh, Stuart Kornfeld, who became a very well-known producer in Hollywood who produced a lot of the Ben Stiller movies like Tropic Thunder, et cetera. They both were there. They flew in from Los Angeles and uh, they were, I think they were down to four contestants, you know, four of us were left in the roundup to decide who would get the role. And uh, I met them, I read for them, I waited a couple of weeks and my manager called me, my agent called me at the time and said, guess who's going to Hollywood? Boy. I, said, I don't know. It, and I got the job. Yeah, that would have been an awesome feeling. It was uh, surreal, to say the least. It was also as much as it was quite the um, achievement. It was also horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> as, when I, when I was, you know, doing my research on you, you've, you've been in like over a hundred. You know, you got over a hundred credits to your name. You've worked with so many iconic actors and and directors, producers. What, what's been the funnest film that you've worked on, like where you've had the most fun and you've enjoyed that the most? I don't know if it's the movies I identify with as much as I identify with the peep, some of the people I work with Yeah, um, that I enjoyed their, their disposition. Uh, David Caruso, uh, a very talented actor who did many television series, one of them being NYPD Blue, then several others, then the, the very the, the one that catapulted him, him, him into stardom on television was called CSI Miami. Yeah. And so I remember that being, it felt like coming home to a circumstance with the professional and someone who I'd worked with before in other, other projects. I had done a movie with David called King of New York. And another movie, when it was one of my first films, China China Girl. And so to see David was just, it was like seeing an old friend, you know, who I got the sense appreciated what I could bring to the table. So that was a memorable experience because it felt personal, yep. you know, and we played off each other so well. He was very giving and very, it was not selfish in the way he 
manifested his instrument, his art. He helped actors, at least he helped me. And I think I helped him because the producers would say, you know, every time you're on the show, Robert, David's levels rock, you know, go up. He gets, he, he comes better. So I think yeah. it was almost, we challenged each other creatively. So that stands out in memory. Um, I also think that my initiation into the realm of show and, and the business, so to speak, was the first film that I, I, I mentioned when you asked me what was my first break or first experience and meeting Richard Pryor and his yeah. compliments and his soft-spoken way around me. There was no pretense. There was no evidence of him lording over me or anybody else that he was this iconic movie star. He was just treated me uh, with respect. And uh, that was quite a gift. Yeah. You've been what I had been told by some others in terms of um, efforts for someone like me uh, in a career of movie acting. Not everybody was excited about me pursuing it. Or first, not always very supportive. Some were, but some were not. And so it was nice to hear from someone like Richard some yeah. things that I kept held close, close to my chest and I needed to hear to inspire me to kind of press on. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, what a person to get get that respect off. Like, That's pretty cool. You've worked with so many iconic people and you know, amazing actors, writers, directors. Is there someone that you haven't worked with that you'd like to, that you think, oh, I really want to work with this person one day? Yeah, there's a couple of actors I can think of right off the top of my head that I would love to work with. Um, I'd love to work with Johnny Depp. Yeah. Um, I want to work with the best there is. I can see uh, you've already Mike, been doing that. Another one comes to mind, uh, Micah Monroe. Mm-hmm. She she appeared in she's appeared in many films, but one in particular that stands out in my mind is a film called Flashback. Like, yeah. Christopher McBride, I think, is the director on that one. But uh, that's when I really took notice. I'd love to work with Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy, he's, he's one of my favorite actors too. I think you two yeah. would be great together on a project. Yeah. I'd like to work with some of the great comedians too, like uh, you know Chris Rock. I don't know if he's making movies anymore. He does a lot of stand-up. But someone yeah. like him. Maybe I'd like to work with some great dramatic, you know, older dramatic actors like uh, Russell Crowe, Denzel Washington. Yeah, I can go on and on. Yeah, <laughs> people. I've got a list <laughs> of people, but those those are the ones that came to mind. Yeah, definitely. You know, and 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 and, so, and and I I think Ben Stiller is quite is a genius. Yeah, in his comedy, and so is uh, Adam Sandler, and Jonah Hill. I think is the young actor, the the young actor I've seen. He's on the rise and doing an eclectic. Yeah. He has an just eclectic body of work. I like that he takes risks and seems to be fearless in his approach to things. Yeah, to the yeah. work. He's come a long way. I've been following him since he was a young actor as well. And yeah, super funny and definitely super talented. What's your top three movies of all time that stick with you? American Graffiti. Wow. Yeah. George um, Lucas. The, the Exorcist, Badlands, Terrence Malick. I mean, there's several others. I could probably give you 10 that I think are you know, yeah. Apocalypse Now. Yeah. One of them. All time favorites. Seems like I've been watching that film forever. Yeah. Um, the Poseidon Adventure, one of Erwin Allen's early, you know, films, or the, the you know disaster movies that were very popular in the seventies. Big fan of those, the, but specifically the Poseidon Adventure because the cast was just stunning. They were, you know, yeah, Gene Hackman, Ernest Borgnine, Shelley Winters, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Red Buttons, Pamela Sue Martin. Before he got into comedy, what's the actor's name that did the, the Naked Gun? Played the captain. I think it was his name. Yeah, it was quite. It was quite a quite a movie. I know the movie. Won the many won many Academy Awards too. Quite a few. Yeah. So it wasn't just you know some mindless vehicle of disaster to, you know thrill people to death it was more i think highbrow because the way the acting and the writing was superb and the film functioned not so much as a disaster movie with you know because nowadays they have all these tricks they can utilize with you know cgi and visual effects and sound effects to dazzle the audience 
into stupidity rather than combine those advances in technology with a solid story, solid performances that have a captivating presence because they're driven by soul power. There's something, there's a profundity in what's being communicated. I think the Poseidon adventure to me is a metaphor for something, this idea of something traveling along in this auspicious fair and then suddenly meets tragedy and, and every the whole world just kind of flips upside down and there's your allegory. You know, like Milton said, long is the way and hard out, that out of hell leads up to light. And they had to get to the, not the top of the ship because the ship had capsized. They had to get to the, the bottom of the ship to get out because it, everything had reversed itself. So I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, definitely. If you look at the movie as a poetic uh, exploration, not just a disaster movie, it was uh, multi-layered. And I miss those kind of films. They combine elements like that. Yeah, that's, that's great. I think, I think sometimes, yeah, they can go too far with the CGI and and effects and take away from the story. Like you know exactly what you said. It's, it's good if they can combine both and have that that beautiful storytelling where it, it's not too distracting and it all works in well together. Who who'd be your top three directors of all time? I already worked with one of them, Clint Eastwood. You know. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, forget about uh, judgment and critique. You'll never win with that sort of thing. Yeah. And don't bother, you know, looking for approval. Um, it's more about just having an opportunity to work with people that you admire. So for me, just to stand opposite of him and for him to invite me in to hire me was enough. I even told him, thank you for hiring me. You know, everything else just lives in the bank, you know, yeah. the way people evaluate things. But uh, that was another surreal type of experience. You know, you got to pinch yourself. Is this really happening? Yeah. Because you, you taught over the years, at least, you know, I was taught for many years, the, the fundamentals and the ideology and the gospel of limitation. And what I come to realize is that the people that communicate this philosophy are limited and locked up in something. And they just try to spread that disease, that virus in other people's minds and destroy uh solid foundation yeah. that's required to you know move in a direction because you feel inspired by something you know so i you know i think it's really important you have you know if, if you're fortunate enough to have experiences with people that have definitely demonstrated to the world uh, a great capacity for creative ability to, and then market it in such a way where they become icons and then you're working with them i think there's something that the artists can, if they want to, not as an ego trip, but more as just, I don't even know, if, yeah, maybe it's a sort of artistic validation that's necessary from another artist who has overcome things that, you know, kind of I wouldn't say, potentially anoints you or just r reminds you that you're in the right place, you're on the right track, and everything else is just white noise. Don't pay any attention to it. That's what I would tell, tell anybody who was embarking on a, a career or was considered themselves woke up one day and realized that they were an artist and they knew, had this overwhelming need to communicate that particular art form you know whatever it is music art dance painting uh, yeah that's that's pretty cool that, that was going to be one of my next questions yeah like what do you what um, advice would you give to someone I, 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 let me just finish the question because I, I only gave you one director I, unfortunately the directors i want to work with have passed away I'd I love to work with Terrence Malick. I, I, he's still around. and uh, uh, He takes risks that very few directors take these days. Um, so Terrence Malick, definitely. And, you know, some directors from the past, like Stanley Kubrick, you know, yeah. gone, but I would have loved to work with him. So those awesome. are the top three. Plenty, plenty, so let's review. Top three directors that I would love to work with. One I have worked with, Clint Eastwood. And second being Terrence Malick, third being, um, what did I name? I'm sorry. Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick. How could I forget that? Yeah. Top three. There's three good choices right there. Yeah. Next, you, you, you answered a bit of it before. Like I was going to ask someone starting out, whether it be acting or not acting, just whatever they want to start out in life. Yeah. Your best piece of advice was like that first starting, they haven't done anything yet, but they want to start. Well, from the artistic perspective, I would say nothing, because what can you tell an artist? An artist either is or isn't. 
I can collaborate with another artist. Um, I think every artist knows, just like an athlete, that you have to practice. You cannot help but practice. Because it's maybe the one thing in your life that makes sense. Maybe it's the only thing in your life that makes sense. So you cannot help yourself but embrace that gift, curse, and how, how you look at it. And uh, immerse yourself in it. Practice it. So I would say to any artist that probably already knows this, any real artist, is that you have to practice. You have no choice. So that's where I would start. And I'd also say once you start to cross the bridge from there to the stage of narcissism, you know, you're exploiting your talent or them, the people in power exploiting a visual aesthetic that you have or a, a type that they've designated you to be, I'd say be careful with that. Uh, I would say get away from the mirror. Yeah. Don't pay attention to your reflection in the mirror. What's staring back at you is not you, it's the devil, so to speak. It's ego, it's vanity. So I would say just focus on the art form. And, you know, if you dive deep enough into the mechanics of industry, you're going to and stick around long enough and do multiple tours, you know, almost like a combat soldier. If you stay within the realm of show, whether it be wherever the apex of it is these days, whether it's L.A., Los Angeles, Hollywood, or down in Georgia, or wherever, there's the mainstream aspect of the business um, dressing up for the latest, greatest, whatever, I would say that you have to go through that process so that you can understand how that mechanism functions and how you can weather it. You know, like you go to boot camp, right? And they teach things in boot camp and it's a simulation basically. Like, you know, you do plays, you go to acting school, you study privately, but eventually comes the war. You have to enter the Coliseum and all the things you've learned and practice independently or with others in collaboration, now you bring to the Coliseum. And now it's a fight to the death. I would say to any person who wants a career in this thing, it's a fight to the death. And what keeps you alive is your ability, your discipline, your conviction. I guess some good genetics too, probably. <laughs> and um and and there's some luck in there, man. There's there's decisions that are made in Hollywood that are arbitrary and unjust and don't always fall into the category, especially lately, talent. They fall into the category of trend. They fall into the category of pornography. Not the most obvious pornography when I say the word people think immediately of that sort of thing, but I don't mean it that way. I mean the manipulation of the physical aspect of being to such extreme where the content gets lost. There's no soul, there's no heart in the artist. There's just a bunch of people talking, looking a certain way and serving uh, something that's popular maybe or unreal. So I think the artist will suffer, the true artist will suffer in the face of realizing that the modern day Hollywood has become more of a theme park ride than a tribute to the craft itself of acting. And it lays heavily on the monarch theology of one particular person carrying it. You know, it's always had that, but it's kind of taken that to a new level because it's introduced this AI element, this technology that now becomes the star rather than humanity's ability to convey plots and characterizations and the writer to communicate thought um, has been diminished somewhat and diluted because of this introduction of uh, effect and sound and how things look. And so I think once the artist recognizes that, it becomes difficult, I think, to continue to fight when you feel that the war you're fighting in or what you're fighting for is hollow, that there's, it's a Pyrrhic victory, you know, you give everything you have as the artist and sacrifice and then realize that it's um, not what you thought in terms of this place you imagine you're going to get to. To me, any artist who's truly an artist knows there's no real place to get to. It's just about 
fine tuning, perfecting the art form itself. And whatever they do or that is what they do that if you attach yourself to that result, then you, you become a yo-yo and your concepts of yourself become distorted based on other people's opinions. And it's ridiculous because you have no control over the final product ultimately, unless you're a corporation, you know, one of the great big movie stars that's not just a movie star person anymore. They're a, they're a banking system. They're part of the corporation because they're worth so much money that they have influence. Yeah. But if you're not sitting that, on that throne, you're kind of just you know pushing giant blocks for Pharaoh to build something, to glorify whatever. And the, the, you know, the results of that effort, what it's going to look like, like I said, once again, it's out of your control. It's like a canvas. If you're a painter, it's just you painting the painting, fine. But if there are other hands on that canvas that can influence, then maybe some of what you've done gets lost, becomes manipulated, diluted, or trivialized. There's all sorts of things that can happen, but I think it's important for the true artists to remember it's not a reflection of their talent. It's just a business. And if you're not so attached to how you look in the mirror, like I say, break all your mirrors, man. You yeah. Don't look at the mirror. Look to your work. The feeling you get when you're performing, that liberating state of consciousness that frees man from the trappings of matrix and fundamental, you know, humdrum reality every day. I think that's why so many people are fast, you know, people are fascinated by escapism, especially in this 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 box that so many people give attention to, the screen, because they see a portal into possibilities of leaving this world that some of them are not so happy in. So it's the ultimate escapism. But I think it's dangerous if you define yourself based on it. Take any kind of definition that, or that hinders you or makes you feel less than the love affair that you originally had with the art itself is a hindrance. It makes people crazy. Yeah. What's your top three favorite books of all time? Yeah, I'm a big fan of the uh, American contemporary writer Charles Bukowski. He wrote a lot of work that communicated to me. Big yeah. fan of his. George Bernard Shaw, Dante's Inferno and the Paradiso. Who wrote is that? Uh, Don, who, who wrote that? It's a toss up between Milton and Paradise Lost and Dante's Inferno. Yeah, Dante's Inferno. Yeah, and you know, Dante's Purgatory, Dante's Paradiso. Let's not forget the apex point. We don't want to stay stuck down in there too long. Yeah. <laughs> Lord knows we've all been here for a while. Your top three favorite film writers of all time. That's a good question. I have to get back to that one. I don't know if I have any. Yeah. I like the old black and white films. Samuel Goldwyn. I like the playwright Tennessee Williams. I love watching black and white films too. Like the old ones. That's yeah. cool. Some of Coppola's stuff is brilliant. Yeah. A lot of it. Yeah, Francis Ford Coppola. A genius. Yeah, he's brilliant. Um, his interpret, you know, his ability to interpret stuff and to kind of make it his own. Another writer uh, that kind of likes to take people into outer space and other dimension is Christopher Nolan. Yeah, he's uh, different. Yeah, um, he doesn't pull his punches. Um, uh, it's just, and you know, Guy Ritchie as well, um, another brilliant filmmaker. I don't know if he writes his stuff or not, but how much of it he participates in that aspect of things, but. I have to yeah. believe a lot of his influences in the screenplay. Yeah. His highbrow entertainment uh, combines all the elements I was talking about earlier you know, that people like, but you've got to pay attention to the story. You can't, you know, it's not just passive observation, his older movies anyway. He may have had to succumb to the marketplace because it's a big banking system. And if your movie's a little bit too intelligent or highbrow, demands too much from its audience, you're going to lose the masses, you're going to lose money. Yep. I dare say because they're systematically dumbing the audiences down with uh, yeah. a certain kind of formula that's there to dazzle and bewitch and, you know, do an assortment of things. But I don't know how much it challenges the mind of the viewer. And some of these, you know, these directors like Oliver Stone, who they've kind of shut down because his political positions and his ability to communicate themes so effectively is probably scary to some people. Um, but if people like that, you know, as another director I forgot to mention, Oliver Stone. Yeah. Would have loved to have worked with him. Anyway, so yeah, that sums it up. Yeah, great. Do you, do you think a lot of 
I guess now it's getting harder for directors, even the more well-known ones to, I guess, have more control over their work. They're getting dictated by the money and exactly what needs to sell rather than going, no, this is my story, this is how I want to keep it. They're getting influence. Yes. I remember uh, Ellen Burstyn, Academy Award winning uh, actress. She had, and during an interview, she had commented on that, saying that they're pushing the creative influence out the door and the money's coming into the room, sitting down and making decisions. And she was seemed to be, just, I don't blame her. She was very understandably disturbed by that. Yeah. So when someone of that caliber says that, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it's not going to get any better, man. So yeah. that's why I think, for at least for me, I can't speak for anyone else. Um, for me, that's why the independent cinema, what's left of it, is so crucial. Not the mainstream, not, you know, movies that make a lot of money necessarily or popular. Um, I just gravitate toward the work itself uh, and that communicates some kind of inside intelligence into the human condition or whatever the subject is, whatever the genre is, where there's a character development, there's a, a solid story where you can tell the writer and the people that came together to produce this thing really care about building something that um, is intelligent and inspiring and an assortment of things that I remember why I watched films in the first place that would make you feel things or discover you learn in film you learn in, in certain, by watching certain movies because they would there's certain directors that were fascinated with the human condition and they would write characters and story dynamics that people can relate to and it's a catharsis by when you watch these things you know you say oh i can relate to this character and so you vicariously observe in a fiction something that's similar in your real life and in that sense movies can help people in a way that's why it's a very dangerous medium nowadays because if you use it to manipulate and communicate things that are lies that have no have nothing to do with the human condition really or you bring the human condition down to the base nature and you make the frequency so disturbing or trivialize the human experience to such a degree that there's no substance i mean what do you have yeah. You have a circus being run by madmen. Yeah. That are driven by the you know almighty dollar. Yeah. And so there's a place for that. And I'm not saying the, I'm not making a I'm, people might say, well, you're making that's quite a broad stroke statement. There's a lot of good stuff that's coming out of the mainstream. I'd say, yeah, there is. There's been some things that have come out that have managed to slip through. Yeah. But um from a subjective point of view as an artist, it's just you know, if you're not participating in that, I'm not going to become obsessed with anything. Uh, yeah. Like my advice before about breaking the mirror, you can enjoy something, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's your best friend all of a sudden. You can see that the mainstream put out something by some stroke of luck. Somebody let something get through, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to start pining over a system that has divorced itself from its responsibility yeah. to the artists for the sake of money. That's why, you know, people are really vicious and carnivorous when it comes to independent low budget movies. They write these things about them sometimes. It's shocking to me. I would think that they would be supportive. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, to independent filmmakers that don't have a whole lot of money to make films, but are trying to put a good story together, something that's rich. Um, and uh, people send teams to focus on the weirdest things. You know, yeah. how much did it cost to make this? What was the shot on? They get so caught up in the technics when they analyze things. It's all about analytics. It's how it's the cinematic science rather than well. Let me ask you this, uh, professor. How did you feel about this film? They're not good at communicating what they feel, I've noticed. Yeah. They're experts at uh, methodically tearing things down based on a mechanical, within the, mecha the mechanics, the mechanical structure of it. And uh, if there's a great performance or there's aspects of the film that in the independent re film realm that is 
mind blowing. They tend to gloss over because uh, the budget was too small or something was slightly off with the lighting. Who knows? They get hung up on these, to me, ridiculous things. Now, granted, you know, if you're going to build a house and you declare yourself to be a carpenter, you know, build a house correctly so that you can have people live it. You don't step through the floor. So I'm not saying, you know, everyone should have license to grab a camera and go make a movie and declare themselves filmmakers. It's like anything you have to practice and learn and perfect your art form. I've seen evidence though, that there are people who do just that only to meet with uh, a rock throwing contest. They're hit with rocks, man. That's their, that's the audience. So, I'd say to all my uh, to, to carry this further with the, my advice to artists is not to pay the attention to compliment nor insult. Yeah. Don't listen to any of it. You can be respectful to either one and say, okay, I don't know why you feel this way, but you're entitled to your opinion. And thank you for the compliment. But don't hang on to either one too tightly. You might be surprised what happens with that stuff. It's important, I think, to just um, do the work because you love the work and recognize that not everybody... These, especially these days, the climate we're living in now, yeah. it seems like an endling, end, endless season of hatred in terms of people's perception or this very critical eye that observes everything, unfortunately. There's no room. There's no mercy. Yeah. For, there's no room for mercy, it seems, in anything. And I think, and I don't know, I, I don't know why. I don't want to get too philosophical, but I, I just, you know, I, my point is, is that I think every artist should just keep his love affair with his art or her art close to their chest so that they it's not confiscated by the bankers and the judge and jury out there that seems to think that they have the office to condemn something. It's like me trying to tell you, Thomas, oh, you like this kind of music? Yeah, man, it's changed my life. I love listening to this stuff. I think it's garbage. Really? Yeah. Have you listened to it? A little bit. But I just think, you know, and I'm completely dismissing all the work that went into that composition, right? Like, for example, I, I can look at things, whether it be films or listen to certain music and realize it's not my cup of tea, as they say. But that doesn't mean I'm going to tear it down. I, I say, yeah, I, just, I can recognize the genius of this. Yeah, I really do. I can see a lot of work went into this. I can tell this is well, this is well orchestrated. You know, people did their homework with this. And I can see why people would be drawn to this. It just doesn't speak to me though, but that doesn't mean I cannot compliment it. They don't seem to know how to compliment something that's not for them yeah. without ripping it apart. They don't know how to, it's, there's no balance in the observations. They become myopic. It's the cyclops. Yeah. One eye, you know, and the laser, boom, you know, and they blow it apart or they praise it. And the irony of it, is, at least for me, and I've talked to a couple of my friends as well, everything that the, the critics like that I watch generally, I cannot stand. And everything that they do not like, I usually enjoy, man. So I'm running opposite. I've always been running opposites. I'm the counter, a real true counterculturist. If I have to, you know, label myself, which I, I'd rather not, I would just say that I'm counterculture all the way. Really counterculture, man. I'm not just like wearing a T. I don't have it, you know, there's no T shirt, there's no label. It's just, you just live and breathe it. You know, there's just things that make no sense to you. And other people go, really? You didn't like that? You know, and there's a lot of them, it seems, these days. And there seems to be the minority of those who see things a little bit different than the collective is diminishing. Yeah. And maybe I'm just paranoid. But then Charles Bukowski <laughs> said, my, my, one of my favorite writers said, the paranoid man is the man with all the facts. So I'm not saying I have all the facts. I'm just saying that something doesn't smell right yeah. out there. I, I, I agree I'm not with the you. the only one that would agree. Oh, see, yeah, you agree. Yeah, yep. so, yeah, who knows? Yeah. No, it's, yeah, everything you're saying is just mind-blowing. You know, yeah, glad you have these views. It's awesome. You got to get over yourself. Yeah. You know, eventually there's the intrusion moment and every being knows they're going to drop, right? Yep. This idea of immortalizing yourself on the screen is a fallacy. It's not true. It doesn't work that way. They will forget you. Yeah. It just happens. It's natural. It's history. Even the history books, they forget the history. People argue about the history now. It didn't really happen that way. Every day is a new day. Yeah. And you gotta let it go and live in the present, which is difficult, you know, when you're waiting, when you're trained the opposite way to wait for the event to occur and then all of a sudden life starts happening. What about all the time in between then? This is where a lot of artists 
I think, or entertainers have quite the difficulty. They get caught up in the narcissism trip and identifying who they are with their popularity or what people think of them. Very dangerous. It's more important to just stay in tune with things that make you happy, the things you love to do. And if you can make a contribution in doing that to people, and if there's maybe a few left in this world that can appreciate that, hey, bravo. To me, that's about as good as it gets. Any, if, if there's people that think otherwise, I feel I feel bad. I don't, and I'm not trying to um, be rude or anything, but I feel sorry for them because they're in for a rude awakening when they get older. Is there anything you're coming up now that you can talk about? Uh, you know, projects you're working on. Maybe you can help me with that. Have you done any research on my most recent resume? Because I forget these things. <laughs> Once I'm done with the project, I kind of I try to remember. I'm told to remember. I received an email the other day that I had to promote something or else because it's in my contract. So, but I did like the film. Uh, I, I a movie that just came out. Is it uh, not? There's one junkie. Was that it? No, it's called Johnny and Clyde. That's it. Yeah. Johnny and Clyde. And um, I had a lot of fun working on this film. Tommy Danucci's a very intelligent, insightful young man. I wish I had his, 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 his brilliance at that age. I was too busy being crazy. But um, I just love what he did with this film. And it's not very appealing to the modern everyday audience. It takes a certain eye to appreciate this really dark, off the wall humor, dark humor, and how ridiculous the whole thing is. And I, you know, it's ironic to me that we live in a, kind of a crazy world nowadays. Maybe it's always been that way. And people's inability to recognize how ridiculous that can manifest on screen is bizarre. It's like they want to control the box, but Everything else in real life is out of control. It's, it's bizarre. But anyway, um, that was a, that's something that I actually had a really, really good time on because Tommy and Chad Verde, the executive producer on that, um, were very, gave me a lot of room to play. It, it was comedy, you know. They let, let me put a wig on. I got to talk in a Southern accent. And generally they don't, you know, people have this misconception that, you tell people, you tell the people in power, you know, what role you want. They tell you. Yeah. And then they also tell you that if you don't want it, there's a hundred people at least standing in line for it. So get off or get off, you know, get, get, you know, get off the fucking line, man, right. or yeah. take it. You know, unless you, like I said earlier, unless you're a corporation and you can drive a whole culture because you start them and make money for the banks and the, corporation that runs the movie industry so to speak basically um then you know it's different but if you're you know a, 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 the i wouldn't even how would i describe it if you're just a working a working stiff a worker bee like you know like most people are in the industry and just trying to get a job then you know you're grateful for the job but then when someone says you know what i see a quality in you that you, they haven't exploited yet and I'm going to let you do that. It's beautiful from the artistic point of view, not from the point of view of vanity, obviously, but from the point of view of like, well, I, it's nice to be able to, you know, and a lot of times your fans will hate you for it or they'll be disturbed because they've gotten so used to one particular thing that you've been assigned to do by the power that tells you what to do. You don't tell them, hey, man, there's so many other things I can do. Yeah, we know that, but that's not going to sell. I'll tell you what will sell. This will sell. And then you become what they want you to become. Yeah. Or you say, no, I'm not going to do that. And you leave the industry and you do plays the rest of your life. You know, it all depends on what your trip is, man. I needed to make a living. Yeah. And I, for many, many years, believed that things would change, that they would allow me freedom, that they would take the handcuffs off me and say, okay, Charlie Manson, you're free to go. Yeah. And some would argue that I'm still in chains. Others would say that I've been released. It all depends on who you talk to. This movie I'm telling you about, Johnny and Clyde, to me is evidence that there's people that recognize that there's a lot more that I'm capable of than I've been allowed to do. And yeah. so to me, that's beautiful yeah. from the point of view of the artist going, wow, it feels so nice that other artists, because Tommy's an artist, and it's Tommy Danucci, the director, he's an actor, he's a director, he's a, he's a writer, he's multifaceted. And so when you have your 
one of your colleagues recognize this ability in you, it's the best feeling. The fans, eh, I love the fans, but you got to be careful with the fans. You know, how much do they know about the craft? Some yeah. of them do. Some of them, how much do they really know about the business other than what they read or what the television tells them? I've been to the Coliseum. I've been there. I've fought in the Coliseum and Caesar looking down at me. I've been amongst gladiators. It's not like I, you know, I was been around just for a couple of years, got lucky, had a break and was on some show. I've done multiple tours, man, in this Mad Hatter circus. So I think that, you know, I might be qualified to point some of these things out. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I think you're definitely more than qualified. Uh, yeah, you've, you've got an incredible you know, history and it just you know awesome person man i i think that's that shows you know just talking to you and yeah you got a good good vibe about you thank you thomas i'm glad you feel that way yeah i, I was just looking before because i had that I had that movie up uh that that one you mentioned and there's also the legend of jack and diane Yes, I would recommend that as well. That, that's what I was trying to think of. My former, my former colleague, like my former, my, my colleague uh, passed away. Tom Sizemore, may he rest. Um, I mean, that was the last, the second to last film I think we did together. We've done several movies together, so he yeah. will be missed. He was so a I would say, actor. You, know, you don't have, yeah, you don't have to like the film. Just see it for Tom's sake. Yeah. Yeah, he is definitely a brilliant actor and gone too soon. Hey, man, yeah. it's a war. People don't realize, you know, yeah. um, there's an aspect to it, man, that's hidden behind the Dorothy curtain, you know, behind the <laughs> Oz, Wizard yeah. of Oz curtain, man. That's, I mean, they touch upon it in that movie, The Wizard of Oz, you know, that he's this midget tyrant. But I mean, what's really there, man? It would blow your mind. Yeah. I told you what, what's standing behind that curtain and the way this thing functions how it if you're not built for the you know this relentless experience for some of pursuit others just you know the only thing they know you got to be able to you know deal with the ptsd deal with the um all the stuff that comes with it man yeah and still keep fighting like the viking yeah valhalla man it's got to be <laughs> like that and some people and they reach their valhalla point valhalla yeah. and they go Mm -hmm. And, you know, people don't understand why is this person gone? Because, man, you got to consider these variables. But unless you're in the war, I mean, how can you tell somebody what it's like if they haven't been there? You can tell them all about it. But unless they've been sh shot in the leg, it's like trying to tell a combat that something. You can't. They can tell you what it's like, but you don't know what it's like to be in a firefight and watch your division commander get his head blown off and watch it sear onto a tank and bubble up like scrambled eggs i mean people say hell is some other place after this they haven't been to war man so yeah. i mean hollywood's the same way <laughs> it really is you won't yeah. you would never think so because how it appears so dazzling yeah. and beautiful behind it trust me when i tell you there is a monster behind that thing many monsters wow and uh, unfortunately it's, i think a lot of it these days is driven by greed obviously driven by greed and so now the audiences are being trained to respond and become devotees, even though they say they hate it. I don't know if they hate it, man. I think they envy it and want to participate, which is fine. Envy makes the world go round. Doesn't make my world go round, but it definitely is definitely can inspire people to do things. That's for mm -hmm. sure. So you know, speaking to people who passed before their time is was my point, though. It's um, yeah, it's a it's a combat zone, man. It's, and people forget that what they're seeing on the screen isn't real. It's make-believe, man. It, they're so good at this, some of these artists that they make you believe. And the directors and the writers, they put something together. Wow. And so you imagine that once the performer walks off stage, he carries this glory rhythm. Maybe for a while. But people will forget. And they'll ask you, what's the next thing? Or they'll diminish it over time. Or you... If you get hung up in the result of some a triumph like that or a curse, you know, it's the agony of victory, not the agony, agony of defeat, because the agony of victory is how do I keep doing this mm -hmm. if you get attached to the result? And then you have to deal with all the people who now can suddenly seek you 
come say to you, when are you going to do something like that again? Yeah, I, I saw that other stuff. But why do you do something like that? It's like, I'm not in control of that. That yeah. was a collaboration and people, they're equal to my ability and better. Every actor knows, will never admit this, to become a movie star knows that they needed a great director to anoint them or some great powerful producer to put them in the position to exploit or to demonstrate the full range of the talent. That's what's like like the mafia mentality. Until you get anointed by a certain aspect of the power, you stay in the cage forever. It doesn't matter how good you are. If they make a decision yeah. to let you through, you get through. If they say, no, not this one, you don't get through. That's just how it is. That's the reality. That's the reality of how it works. It doesn't matter how good you are. And then, like I said, even if you champion the glory of multiple victories, if God help you, if you don't continue to do that, the the rest of your career, the critics will show up like vultures ready to rip your carcass apart as they watch the inevitable descent, as you, you know, the, the inevitable descent of what they, you know, of your movie, you know, the descent of your career based on how they perceive the movies or the quality of your work, et cetera. You're look, it's looked at under a microscope, especially these days. Yeah. And so, you know, how do you, how does any sensitive being or, or artist survive that? Some do. And they build a thick wall around them. They, you know, they learn to get thick skin, just like in war. Others, they turn to things or do things to distract themselves. And it helps, but also it could be worse than the original problem. Who's to say? Yeah. Not, you know, God. I just know that there are many, many casualties down the yellow brick road. Yeah. They should have paved it red, not yeah. yellow. Yeah. Incredible. Good, man. I, I, I don't want to make, make sound, uh, it's, it's like this dire exposition. I am grateful. Yeah. I have tremendous gratitude. That I've been able to make a living yeah. and eat the, the fruits of my labor. Literally, I don't, you know, Forget the paper. I'm just grateful that I can go to the store and buy food. And you know, I, I, I've been doing. I'm collecting a pension at yeah. this point. You know, I. So um, it's nice to know that all the time spent and was not in vain. It, you know, it was it had to mean something. And other yeah. people will decide if it means something, and other people won't even know what it is. They won't even know who I am or what I've done. There's a lot of that. I'm not so mm. deluded to think that you know just because you're kind enough to grace me with the interview. It doesn't mean that when I walk into the market that the majority of the people in the supermarket don't even know me from Tom, Dick, or Harry. And then other places, then they go for whatever reason. Hey, can I have your autograph? You know, yeah. it's a it's a it's a profound moment for that individual. And other people are staring because they don't get it. Yeah. Who was that guy famous? And next thing you know, it starts this conversation. So when you start to witness it like that, you know, you you learn quickly not to get too hung up on these things and just let them go and be grateful for the basics, which is health, right? Love yeah. in your life, friendship. If you have kids, you know, uh, yeah, those are a blessing. They, 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 they teach you things. And uh, did I say health? I think I did. And, uh, yeah. and the ability to take care of oneself and people that you love. And you know, especially in today's economy, if you can make Jack, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave you with one quote. I remember I was Jack Lemon, great, great, one of my favorite actors of all time, Jack Lemon. Um, he said he was on the Johnny Carson show, I think, in the 1980s, maybe, or I don't know if it was the 70s, 80s, or maybe 90s. I think it was either 70s or 80s. But the point is that he said to Johnny Carson, and you got to remember, Jack Lemon in his time was like a big movie star, you know, based on that standard, you know, and he was in all his, his resumes, very prolific, you know. He had everything from comedy to you know days of wines and roses, you know, a, you know, a, a plethora of, of impressions, a true artist. And he said, forget about any delusion or you know a pipe dream of becoming a movie star. If you can make a living in this business, you've won. Yeah. I never forgot that. It really stuck. Somebody of his caliber in that position to say something like that. I've yet to hear anybody talk along those lines. They're always talking about themselves because they're pushed to talk about the commodity, the property, and joke about it because they have to make money. So it's a different time now. People don't, they're not as candid like they used to be back in the 70s, I think. Remember Robert Blake on the Johnny Carson show would say things about the studio people he had to deal with and the egos. He wasn't afraid to say it like it is. 
you know, yeah. nowadays you can't say anything or they'll yeah. come and get you off yeah. of his head, off of their <laughs> head. Yeah. You know, oh, he committed treason and heresy against the agreement. Go get him. Oh, we'll do even better. We'll just end him or end yeah. her. We'll end their career. <laughs> yeah. They can. Trust me. Scary. If enough people get together in that position, if you're in that level and decide, you know what, we're going to open up that door, trap door, and down you go, down you go. They will throw you off the building. Just ask Mickey Rourke, he'll tell you. But then he met mm -hmm. Darren Aronofsky. Yeah. And Darren Aronofsky petitioned, said, hey, guys, look, I got a surprise for you. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I got a surprise for you. And he handed the Mickey back. Yeah. And he got a pass. Okay. I said, okay, Mickey, we'll let you do some more things. Because he definitely reinvented you in such a way that you fall back in love with you all again kind of like the fans do they fall in love with you then they fall out of love with you it's just like this you know it's a very adolescent type of relationship with some not all but some fans truly appreciate the artist's work efforts and they are inspired by that incarnation so i don't want to trivialize you know speak like all the fans are mindless uh you know i'm just saying that you're very, you know, it's far and few between the experience that type of appreciation when people have been paying, like you, paying attention yeah. to your body of work. That's, that's pretty cool about the Mickey Rourke situation as well. Well, yeah, I mean, he didn't yeah. work for a while. He pissed yeah. a lot of people off and then was sit down in a studio apartment in Venice for a year yeah. and was taking, you know, Sean Penn was kind enough to put him in um, that film he did, uh, I think it was Crossing Guard. Yeah. And then uh, Vincent Gallo, who did uh, Buffalo 66, he hired him, played a cat. So Mickey was doing cameos with, you know, colleagues that respected Mickey and fans of his, no doubt, and saw his monstrous talent and were like, sucks, man, but I'll hire you. You know, I've got clout. I've got power. They don't want you. I, I, you know, so he was invited into situations, but, you know, more than just the cameo based on the business of show and how they weigh things, it's insignificant to them, you know. Until yeah. something comes along where Mickey is the star of the film and the whole story revolves around that phenomenon. And they reinvent the wheel, so to speak, and they go, oh, wow. And then we can make money with this, too. And they capitalize on it as well. And when you start getting notice from the Academy of Power in that standard, then people tend to value those things. You know, to me, the value was lost when Marlon Brando did not accept his Academy Award for The Godfather and sent a Native American Indian to receive the award on behalf of the atrocities committed to the indigenous people of this land. Wow. So he didn't care, man. And yeah. after that, to me, I turned it off. Yeah. Then it was just, to me, a bunch of rich people, like a bunch of bankers just meeting each other. Shake. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those people. Some of those people are incredibly talented, but yeah. Some of the people that you're seeing are like the politicians that are being governed by a much more powerful entity behind them that you cannot see. And they're just doing their job. They're showing up smiling and some of them could be miserable. You wouldn't know. Yeah. Um, so I'm not saying some of these movie stars I have any issue with as much as what they are made to do once they are put in that position. It just becomes just a, a status thing, you know, and how much money and the gowns and it just, everything is measured in the way of commerce and uh when you start the scales start tipping too much that you know and, and and weight on that rather than something else then you lose me yeah you know unless you're you know you're a materialist and that's your thing that's all you care about you, how things look and how they appear and you know tinseltown right so the yeah. argument would be well that's why they call it tinseltown well yeah yeah i guess so i wanted to ask you too you know you said um clint eastwood was your favorite director or one of them, one of your favorites to work with. What what was he like as a person on the set, like to just interact with? Um, no, no pretense. Soft spoken. There are times it was as if he wasn't even there. He made himself invisible. I know people who know how to do this. They just their frequency just he goes in, and they're just you know they're there though. Yeah. But they don't need to make themselves known that they're there. They don't, he didn't carry his celebrity with him. Yeah. He was, I don't think he was even aware of it. He was too involved in his process, man, which is beautiful to witness an, an artist yeah. who's, from the point of view of evaluation of you know, this idea of movie star, oh man, movie star, but he wasn't carrying the star with him. He either threw it away or left it at the door, whatever he was doing. Him and I did an improv 
there was something scripted in the garage originally and i went off book i just started making stuff up and he went with me and he didn't um you know i didn't wasn't reprimanded for not sticking to the program or he liked the fact that i could play jazz i showed him quickly that i wanted to separate myself from the group and do something that was courageous and could have got me fired but i, I did it because i felt it's all about taking, I feel that it's always about taking risks and what better way to take a risk in front of the man, so to speak, and, yeah. and, tr and be confident enough in that. And then when he, when the person responds to you, he responded, he didn't like, look at me like, what is he doing? He didn't look at the script supervisor. He didn't look at anybody. He just went with it. And then I went with him. And so we were like really playing, man. I threw him the ball. He threw it back. Even if it was only for a few seconds, I always tell my friends, this who are actors, that's not how much time, you have on film or on camera it's what you do at the time because you can make so much impact in those moments that people never forget or they remember for a while is a better way to say it yeah. you can be in the whole movie if the movie is not memorable then they won't forget you so it's yeah. not about how much time in the film it's what happens in those moments yeah that affect people because a lot of people can't remember all the details of the things they watch especially nowadays there's so much product yeah. thrown in your face right how can yeah. you remember everything so Absolutely. you know, you ask me my favorite actors I want to work with. I blanked out. You know, so I got a whole list of them. You know, I gave you the ones that came to mind first. But I'm just saying, mm -hmm. it's the same thing with this. You know? I've seen a, a couple of clips you're in on on YouTube. I was looking up uh, the one with Steven Seagal is like 19 million views on it, mm -hmm. and uh, another one of you in Death Race is like 4.3 million views. Uh, like you. <laughs> You always have a great impact, whatever you're in. You you stand out and deliver. So I think that's appreciate the compliment, awesome. Thomas. Thank you. Amazing person, and what's it like, you know, doing what you love and being able to make a living off that? That must be a special it's like, feeling. It's like well, there's uh, it's like a marriage. <laughs> there's good days, really beautiful days, and there's not so good days. Yeah. You know, romance is more, you know, a kind of a temporary thing. People romanticize the idea so long and put it out way into the future. So you romanticize it forever, right? Yeah. But when it actually happens, it's kind of like that movie California Split with uh, George Siegel and Elliot Gould when at the end the guy goes, there's no great feeling. What do you mean? You won the whole pot. You won everything. Yeah, but there's no great feeling because he was an addict. And after a while, there, he, it didn't mean anything. Yeah. So there are times, you know, if you romanticize it too much and have delusions of grandeur about it and think it's going to take you to some special place and you have this euphoria constantly because you're amongst the stars and you're suddenly enlightened now, you're in trouble. Uh, I don't see any evidence that that's what happens. Yeah. So, um, but I would say, though, that, you know, keep your wits about you and you'll be okay. <laughs> but and and recognize it's a marriage and yeah. you know it's give and take man you know sometimes it treats you well sometimes it doesn't sometimes you wonder why you got into it in the first place you want to get yeah. out and like you know it's, it's a marriage man the other stuff is easy it's aesthetic absorption wow this looks great it's like puppy love people there's a lot of people i come across that are just starting out that have puppy love with the idea of movies they fall in love with the aesthetic aspect of it yeah and what it promises. And to me, that's a kind of a very, it's a, an adolescent perception of what it really is. It's a marriage. It's not uh, dating. It's not a, a temporary romance. It's a lifelong commitment to something that is going to make you lose sleep at night and at times make you feel like you're walking two feet off the ground and is going to drop you from a building. It's an assortment of things, it's kind of like love. Yeah. As much as it will crown you, it will crucify you, as is written in the book, book The Prophet by Kabil Cabron, another great writer I like. Yeah, I don't know if I pronounced his name right, but The Prophet. Yeah. So as much as it will crown you, it will crucify you. Mm -hmm. They raise you up so they can tear you down. And I know this. <laughs> I've been reading some of the reviews on some of these movies I've been in. So yeah. there's a lot of people quick to uh, rip it apart. But like I said, if you're smart or, you know, want, maintain any semblance of mental health you will not pay attention to the ranting to the lunatics out there who, who are motivated by god knows what <laughs> yeah because yeah, like i said you know they're going this way they're going this way i'm going that way like all the yeah. things that are popular and that people deem noteworthy put me to sleep and yeah. the things that people don't understand or don't does not communicate to the pop popular uh vote i can I'm enamored by. Yeah. So I 
guess I'm a little out of step with things. <laughs> Jason, yes, like support the underdog kind of mentality. I would say it's the, I would say support. No, I would say it's, it's the underdog is them. Yeah, parading around or something grand. Yeah. You're it's, right. You know, the, the, the wisdom lies in the simplicity and the humility, not in the yeah. grandiose spectacle. That's the lie. Yeah. So there is the, so the, the, the un, they are the underdog I in the like sense it. that they've sold out. They've sold their soul for uh, something. Yeah. They've given away something sacred and yeah. made it into what did Jesus was, was angry in the temple and he threw over the tables and yeah. yelled at the money changer. He says, you've turned my temple into a, into a marketplace. This is a place of worship and holy yeah. moments, not a marketplace. So if you know, if you're you're gung ho, Mr. Artist or Mrs. Artist type person, you might feel that uh, uh, you know these underdogs have raped and pillaged something holy. Yeah. It all Definitely. depends on who you talk to. Yeah. Someone might look at this and go, "That guy's clearly out of his mind, <laughs> or he's bitter, or he's on drugs, or who knows." I don't really care. No, I don't I've think been, so. It's, I've been as high as I could go, I guess, with, with what people imagine success is. And, I, and there was no up there. Yep. When I was up there and people said to me, can you feel the power? I'm like, no, I feel like I want to commit suicide because mm. I knew the truth. Wow. It, success didn't bring me a better class of friend. It brought me a better class of enemy. And all the opportunities showed up. <laughs> and I was not human anymore. I was just a thing. Yeah. And if you let, if you start to believe in that, you're really in trouble. Yeah. God help you, or some, or whatever you believe in, help you. I will say God. God is the word that we use to put all the other words to one, right? So yeah. say God help you. Yeah, I, I like everything you've said, and you, you got a lot of good good insight. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it's just you know my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> if what's what's one role that you want to play that you haven't done yet? I think I already did. I, I made. I wrote my own movie. Yeah. Uh, called Amer It's entitled American Trash. I wanted to play a man who had a good, has a good heart, but yet is dealing with circumstances that are larger than his heart's capacity to handle. Yeah. And has to find some type of faith not to ruin his life. And there's love present in the midst of all this, which is kind of like how life is. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to write something that had some insight. I didn't want it to trivialize the characters that I wrote. So I wrote this as well and directed it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that has already been done. Nice. Because if I wait for others to do it, I might not be here. I don't know how much time I have. You know, None of us do. Yeah. So you got to get busy doing rather than busy waiting. And I realized that no one was going to write this thing. I had to write it. And people would say to me, directors I know, would say, when are you going to do your own thing, man? You, you think you could do it? Yeah. And then I showed a, uh, my screenplay to a, for a close friend of mine, Josh Weber, and um, he read it and he said, man, this is good. We like this. So yeah. I just you know, put the pedal to the metal, so to speak. Put the pedal to the metal. <laughs> and so that I've been, you know, edit, I'm in the editing phases of that. We talked about editing earlier, right? So yeah, I'm in yeah. post-production phase of editorial be done with the rough cut soon and go into color correction and sound design, but I'm really enjoying what I'm seeing because I've never seen anything like this before. And meaning that it's not big or small, it's just because I've never been allowed to participate in a story like this. And I've watched so many movies. I'm a film historian. I like movies from the 1940s. I like silent movies. I like film noir from the 70s. I, I'm just, you know, I'm a bookworm, so to speak, yeah. when it comes to film. And so, um, I've learned a lot and I guess been influenced by so many different types of storytelling and directors and writers, I guess that I, and I saw how I was being communicated in on the, you know, within media. And I thought, okay, this is okay for a while. Maybe this is good for the first 10, 20 years, but after a while, if you're truly artistic and want to, have developed and grow you have to take some risks and that sometimes means doing it yourself a lot of times i think it means doing it yourself maybe all the time yeah. and everything else is just everything else but uh, so i would say yeah, american trash is the first time i feel totally in its totality that i am attempting to communicate these years of of 
observation and put them to practice. I don't know what's result. I can't say it's going to be great. I can't say anything. I can't judge it. I don't even judge my characters. I just portray the character to the best of my ability. And such with this film, I've constructed something to the best of my ability that I want it to be bluntly honest. Because I haven't been allowed, I think, even within the fiction, so to speak, and here's the paradox, to communicate a truth that I felt was respectful of my artistry. With this film, though, I feel like I, I got close to that. Close yeah. enough. Because I'm not about, you know, he goes crazy with perfection. Forget about that. Just do your best. Yeah. And, you know, that's all you can do. And maybe occasionally you get, you get lucky and somebody goes, oh, you know, how did you do that? And they ask Ma so Lawrence Olivier, how did you do that? He goes, I don't know. Yeah. And he was crying because he didn't know yeah. how on that particular night when he did that play, that famous play that he did, he doesn't know why that particular night stood above every other night. Because yeah. you can't control it. You think you can. You can't. I can't wait to see it when it comes out now. That's going to be going to be awesome, man. I would appreciate any uh, participation in the uh, in what I uh, what I built. You build something. You hope maybe someone will come inside the house and take have a seat. They can leave. Sure. You know, they may not like. You know, <laughs> they may yeah. like the house, but at least they come in, sit for a while, and take a look around. Yeah. That would be enough. Definitely. You build things as catharsis for yourself to maybe liberate as an artist and in the hopes too that maybe your contribution can be that if you've been irresponsible or they've been irresponsible with the way they've communicated your creative ability that maybe it's time to take responsibility for that artistry and be an honor it by writing something and putting something together that speaks more to what you know to be true than what they've imagined it to be in regarding you because everybody they treat different depending on the agenda. And that's fine. It's good business. I'm not saying there's anything nefarious about it. It's, it. Or maybe it is. I don't know. It all depends on how you look at it. But, yeah. you know, it's just good business because it is a business, right? They're selling fairy tales. They're selling yeah. what they're selling. And the fairy tale princess looks a certain way. And over the years, that changes. And the fairy tale prince looks a certain way. And whatever's in between looks a certain way. And so it's a visual medium. Yeah. And so they defined it in the physics of that. And so it doesn't matter you know, how good you think you are. If they feel, yeah, but you won't sell tickets playing this type of role because the fairy tales have permeated the collective soul of the, you know, the species for, for a long time. And people are very attracted to things that are beautiful, you know, whether it's the paintings that taught them to view things a certain way or the movies, or storybooks, whatever, they have been trained psychologically to identify with things a certain. And if it doesn't appear in the way that they've been trained, they, don't, they can't have the fantasy, so to speak. They can't fall in love with it. That's why the Beauty and the Beast movie is so, story is so profound. And I felt bad when he transformed, I guess, backwards into that prince, because I kind of fell in love with the character of the Beast. beast. You know? Yeah, it was something about him that seemed less, it was more human than this perfection that manifests in a certain form. But that's mm -hmm. what they've trained a lot of people to respond to. Because I think when people see the imperfections of what they look at in their physical life or their emotional life or psychic life, and they see the, sometimes the ugliness of, of human existence, not always the beauty of it. Even if you go into a forest, you might be plagued with thoughts about things that deny you the vision. Um, you want to uh, have dreams about people or places and project yourself into that world as a form of escape to get out of this place. So you want to escape into the screen for a couple hours and pretend you're one of these people and imagine. And so for some people, if they've identified with an archetype, whether it be the matcha or the bleeding man or the, you know, the, the, you know, the bombshell, you know, the, 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 the goddess, so to speak, um, or everything that stands in between that satisfies something, they're going to lean on certain archetypes that appear very specifically a way that has been agreed upon. This is beautiful. This is engaging. This is attractive. You know, because you got to remember when I was getting tattoos years ago, when I was in Australia in the eighties, when I did my West back, tattoos were not popular. Yeah. You were considered an, an anthem, a curse. 
walking around. They were ugly and frowned upon by men and women. I remember, I don't know how many women told me, what woman's going to want to look at that? And then all these years later, I see yeah. a beautiful woman tattooed as much yeah. as I am walking around and, and beautiful young men yeah. and everything in between, community them, communicating themselves in the art form. So it changes over time too, you know, what people consider to be attractive. But I still think there's a, a basic blueprint you know, the regardless of the ink that is very prominent. If you take a close look, you can see how it's designed and why things are appealing. There's whether I don't know who the culprit is, if it was Michelangelo or you know the famous sculptors or the people that cemented forever certain imagery in the collective oversoul psyche to imagine that things have to appear very specifically for us to trust them. I can fall in love with this man. I can fall in love with this woman. I can fall in love with the in-between because it appears based on what my subconscious has taught me through the fairy tales. Okay. Is that reality though? Or is it a fairy tale? And that's where the fairy tales are fun, but they can also be very dangerous because it's not, they're lying Yeah. in a way. The subtext of the story sometimes, depending on how profound the fairy tale, can teach a lesson to help not just children, but adults as well to realize things that they've forgotten. You know, a simple nursery rhyme like row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, merrily, merrily, merrily. Yeah. Life is but a dream. That's like Edgar Allan Poe stuff, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's but it's, a, it's just a little, you yeah. know, little nursery rhyme. Yeah. So you see what I mean? So it all depends on what you do with that stuff. If you take the obvious route, which is to exploit it and make it appear a certain way, then yeah, then everybody will want all the young women, young men, and everybody in between will look at it and go, oh, I want to emulate that because that's beauty, that's power, yeah. that's sexy, that's the majesty of glory of the physical, right? And that changes over time. We're living in an age now where it's, 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 it's transforming itself into other aspects of being, you know? So who can keep up? And I would say, why bother? Just like I said earlier, Stay true to the art form and you'll be okay, I think. Wow. And if not, then, you know, find something else. To do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I'm serious, man. I mean, yeah. it's, you got to run off a cliff, basically. Yeah. You know, more or less symbolically, you got to run off that cliff, man. It's a leap of faith. Of, of it. I'm not talking about, like I said, the romantic aspect. I'm talking about the marriage, if you really... You've got to go at it like your life depends on it because it does. And your ability to handle the free fall of that, of that leap of faith, what happens from the beginning of your life when you come into realization that you're an artist to the end of your life when it's completed at your task and it's accomplished, that's the free fall now. And it's not like you can't be a weekend warrior. You can, but then you're not really in it. You're yeah. just kind of touching the scratch in the surface of it. You've really got to go deep. And sometimes when people go too deep, they get all messed up and they don't come out the same way or you hear stories of people. But it's not all dire. I mean, there's other aspects of it that demonstrate the possibility of a good life and the ability for one to be celebrated. If you believe in the red carpet, if you believe in the glory of, you know, Cinderella's ball. Yeah. But once it, it hits midnight, what happens? Everything turns back to something right yeah to me that's where it needs to end <laughs> you know in the, re <laughs> in the realization that not everything's perfect see so it's a temporary state all of it is once you realize that from i guess a spiritual point of view if you want to give it a label then it's not such a problem it's just yeah. you're grateful once again to be able to do something you love to do and sometimes something you hate to love I love to hate or whatever. <laughs> you have mixed <laughs> feelings about it certain days. Like, why did I ever get into this? And then other days, you're like, oh, I, I remember why I got into this. So it's it's that. So yeah. there has to be commitment. Yeah. No commitment, then you're just you're 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 betraying something in yourself and then those around you and what you're doing. That's some beautiful message. What's your favorite music? What what do you listen to? I'm a classic rock guy, man. I'm stuck like in the 1960s, 70s. I listen to the Allman Brothers, Jefferson Airplane, the Chambers Brothers, Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, um, you know, Black Sabbath, ACDC. Um, yeah. I keep going, man. And, you know, all, all, you know, Crosby, Stills and Nash. I like soul music. I like gospel, you know, from the 1940s. Blind Willie Johnson. Uh, 
Robert Johnson, you know, Crossroads. Yeah. Crossroads, Robert so, Johnson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I have a kind of, I like classical music. How yeah. about you? Pretty much, I, I love all the same. I, I love, yeah, like classical. I can listen to hip hop, you know, jazz and blues, rock. Yeah. I, yeah. I can't believe you said Robert Johnson, Crossroads. Mm. I remember when I was first learning guitar, like I, someone was teaching me yeah. that. And it was, wow. We're, we're all there, man. We just forgot some of us. We're all there, man. <laughs> yeah. That's so yeah. cool. I can't believe you said that. That's awesome. Yeah. There's a great documentary I watched once. Yeah. About, I think it was called The Crossroads about him years ago. It was cool. He's like making his first guitar and stuff. Wow. Well, one thing, what was it like working on Waterworld? Um, that I'll sum it up. It was a paid vacation and it was auspicious. It was yeah. fun. And I got to meet uh, Kevin Costner. He was very friendly. And I met some very other people that were very friendly. Kevin Reynolds was very nice. He directed that, I believe, right? Yeah. And I got to go to Kona for a week and look at some of the most beautiful sunsets, man. And get paid. <laughs> yeah. What else can I say about it? You know, you, you want to talk. You want to talk about the movie. I can talk about the movie. I just, you know, I rather just focus on the aspect of it that yeah. was fun and fulfilling. And people came at that time. A budget like that was unheard of, right? So, yeah. my so-called colleagues and fellow thespians felt, that, you know, their duty to remind me of what an embarrassment that was. But I thought these were the same people that were unemployed and working in jobs that they hate. So I learned quickly that the envy factor was huge. Um, so I was not ashamed of anything. Yep. There are a lot of people that knew me years ago when I was a young man and saw me getting into trouble with the law that didn't think I would live past 20. Yep. Or that I would end up in prison, given some things that happened. So for me to be on the island of Kona shaking hands with Kevin Costner, I'd say is a far departure from... Definitely. A self-destructive life that I came from, because that's yeah. what I came from, man. I came yeah. from hell, Damn. and I came out of the hell. I think that's why I can identify with so much storytelling that is about human beings struggling to climb out of that pit, so to speak, in their hearts, in their minds, whatever you want, in their lives, so that they can finally recognize the light and all yeah. the things that they put in their way to obscure the light are now gone, and they're free. What is the saying in the Old Testament? My soul is set free, yeah. like from the snare of fowlers. I'm glad you yeah, got into a better situation. What a way to do it. Yeah. So I'm, if of anything, I'm grateful for the industry. But you got to remember, it was a different animal back in the 1980s when I first started, yeah. late 80s. There was the creative element was present along with the money. And uh, there were some very nice people I met early on, at, even at the studio level. Very they had a soul and a heart. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying they're all soulless, heartless, but maybe, I don't know. I don't really care, man. Honestly, I'm not really intimidated. Mm -hmm. um, so I used to be because I believed it to be something. And then I realized, oh, wait a minute. This isn't God. <laughs> <laughs> people, make it, people make it God. Yeah. The movie studio becomes the temple or the synagogue, the church or whatever, the magic place. That becomes yep. the religion, and you become the devotee, the disciple of that religion. And so either you're exalted, and you're allowed to fly amongst the celestial body and the stars of heaven, or you're put into the pit, fiery hell. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to be careful with the mythology they play around with. You, know, you got to be able to overcome and transcend it and see it for what it is. Yep. What it is and what it isn't. Has, has there ever been anyone you've been really excited to meet, and then when you met them, they... I guess weren't what you expected. Yep. Yeah. I say, yeah, I, I, I tell, I've told some of my friends this. I said, the, God help you if you ever meet some of the people that you become uh, enamored by or that you have this uh, fantasy of about yeah. in terms of what the work situ what the working situation might be like, you know, what it would be like to create with them. But then again, it's not always the case, right? I yeah. never thought I'd work with wasn't the first time I auditioned for Clint Eastwood. There have been other projects that I auditioned for that I didn't get hired for that he was directing. So right. um, it doesn't always turn out poorly. It can sometimes turn out wonderful. You just never know. It's like putting yeah. your hand, you close your eyes. It's a whole thing. You got to put your hand in. It's the faith element, jumping off the cliff, you know, 
Yeah. Oh, this water down there? Oh, you guys didn't tell me. We can't tell you. You just got to jump. Yeah. <laughs> you can't tell you what's in the bag. You guys got to close your eyes and reach in. And hey, man, sometimes you pull out a rabbit. Sometimes you pull out a rattlesnake. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the game. Yeah. And yeah. you got to be able to reach down into the bag, man. Well, wow. <laughs> yeah. that's awesome. Maybe it's, the, maybe it's the devil's bag. I don't know. It's some bag that they placed in there. Yeah. Down there. It's going to take a chance. Digging in that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Man, yeah, it's incredible. I've had a great time chatting with you. To end it off, what, do you have a message for the world, like a positive note to end on? Well, not end on, I guess, to be continued. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. I would just say um, when, this, when you're in the store or you're in the, you know, the market or you're on the highway, freeway, you're on the street, just consider how easy it is to – be courteous to your fellow man. Like, say hello or after you. Let the car go in front of you. Say hello to the person working in the bank or the market. If they're having a rough day, make small talk. Someone, especially who appears the way I do, apparently, even in today's age, some people are uncomfortable when I step up in front of them. So I've learned how much the value it is as humans for us to share common courtesy, which unfortunately doesn't seem to be that common these days. So I would just say, try to be nice to one another, man. So we can make it so the species can continue. Despite what they're doing, you know, the governments are doing and stuff. We, the people or us, us, we can still try to be nice to one another, regardless of what they're telling us or making us, believe and be devotees of fear i'd say forget about the fear take a risk say try to be courteous to someone you might be surprised i was to after all these years of carrying the weight of aggression that i thought was serving me i realized it wasn't serving me this much except in front of the camera and when i finally threw that off and uh, started being friendly with people i was amazed at the response i got I used, at first, it was like an acting exercise because I didn't practice that. But once I practiced it, it wasn't even a role I was playing anymore. I really believe it. Like when I say hello, I mean it. I see somebody in the store, how are you doing today? Are you okay? I mean it. And sometimes people are taken back because we're entering a, a phase of existence now with humanity where everybody's become desensitized or afraid of them. trust each other, man. So when yeah. someone brings it real to you, it's almost like committing yeah. treason against the unspoken agreement. You yeah. know, do not trust thy brother. <laughs> yeah. You know, watch your brother, watch each other. You know, and I would, I would argue against that, that I would say you could, like the Bible says, you know, be as wise as a serpent, but as innocent as a dove, you can still be kind and be aware. You don't have to be uh, a dick. Yeah. You can, you know, you can be cool with people and also be mindful of the circumstance and be responsible. If you're in the middle of a street and a car's coming, get out of the street, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's basic. Yeah. You know, if someone has a negative frequency, get away from them, you know, um, don't get involved in drama. Don't participate in conflict. Try to be, a, a, you know, a light in the world coming from someone who's had to manifest this idea, this belief that people have in this idea of this, problem of evil or destructive uh, force in the world as so much as they've as they've uh, communicated in the mythos my character this character they've assigned me as devil you know so because i've explored this and allowed it to permeate possess me and channel it i've learned some things about its uses and also its dilemma and, and which i think has made me able to realize and how important it is to to embrace humility, not arrogance. Embrace humility, yeah. not arrogance. Appreciate you coming on, Mr. Lasada. It's it's been an honor having you here on Thomas Berryman Thank TV. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Thomas. And Thank you. Blessings, brother. Okay. And blessings. I'm glad we could talk, and real happy to meet you. It's been a yeah awesome time. Glad you feel that way. Yeah, I'll send you a message and yeah. Okay. Be well and be safe. Okay. Thank you, sir.